Thank you very much, Patrick. I hope everything's been going well with your conference. It's uh, certainly interesting times and technology is saving us, enabling us to continue these conversations. So um, the discussion I'm chairing today is Beyond Plastic Recycling, Innovations for Sustainable Packaging. And, you know, without doubt, this continues to be a hot topic, whether it's focused on alternative or novel materials, reuse and refill systems, um, and of course, other technology innovation throughout the value chain. Um, there's the added challenge of how to engage consumers on what is meant by sustainable packaging. For a lot of them, it's very black and white. Plastics are bad, anything else is better. Um, but there's the added complexity, as we all know, around alternative materials, whether it be around the climate change conversation, especially. Um, that's definitely front of mind when it comes to carbon emissions associated with other materials. So um, at this stage, I'd like to welcome our panellists who I've read through their bios and, and stalked them a bit on LinkedIn. Um, and they bring a wealth of experience, um, both public and private sector, and hopefully will be able to give us a balanced perspective on this topic. So firstly, we welcome Edward Sims, who's a um, environment and sustainable development consultant with 10 years experience in European and international public policy and the circular economy. He's got an academic background in economics, politics and public policy, and his professional expertise covers raw materials, waste, energy and sustainable finance. He has extensive experience in working with a broad range of stakeholders, including governments, and worked as a senior political advisor within the European Parliament. So welcome, Edward. James Close is our second panellist. Um, currently head of the Circular Economy Programme at London's Waste and Recycling Board, an organisation focused on encouraging recycling, accelerating the circular economy and helping London become a net zero city. He has a background in sustainability and climate change and has worked extensively across the public and private sectors in London, the UK and internationally. Prior to joining LWARB, James was the director for climate change at the World Bank in Washington, DC, which must have been a fascinating uh, post role. He's also been a partner at Ernst & Young, so we've got an Ernst & Young connection there, and the head of corporate and finance team at Her Majesty's Treasury. In 2010, he was the author of the Mayor of London's Prospectus for London as a low carbon capital. He is the chair of the advisory board of the Blockchain and Climate Institute, the very current blockchain, of course. And then finally, we welcome Marcus Allegre. Now, English isn't Marcus's um, first language, so um, I will be speaking slowly, but hopefully not in a condescending way, Marcos. Um, he comes to us from the Cleaner Production Center in Peru. He's the president of Grupo GEA, who operates the National Cleaner Production Center in Peru since 2007. Currently, Marcos coordinates Grupo GEA's project accelerating the transition to circular economy in plastics, supported by the, by the British government in Lima. He has 25 years of experience in environmental engineering projects with local municipalities, national public health entities, and private industries as well. Former Vice Ministry of Environmental Management, Ministry of Environment from 2016 to 2018, and President of the Global Network on Resource Efficient and Cleaner Production, in, since 2016. He's also a member of the scientific committee of the World Resources Forum, uh, Forum based in Switzerland 2019. So as you can see a whole wealth of experience across both public and private sector hopefully will uh, spark a lively debate. So we'll go straight into the presentations here and first up we've got Edward from Ernst & Young. Thank you Edward. Thank you very much Paula. I'll just uh, share my screen and get into straight into my presentation. Um, so I'm going to be presenting a bit about um, our work on plastics um, at EY. Um, I'm based in Belgium um, in the EY's uh, global center of expertise on the circular economy. So I'm working a lot with uh, public sector, but also private sector, global corporates on circular economy, um, also packaging and uh, innovations in the packaging space. Um, I'm going to do basically a high level overview. I know I've been listening in um, yesterday and today, there was a lot of discussion on waste and plastics. That's all very interesting and all, all related back to uh, packaging. So just a, a high level package, a high level overview of circular economy and packaging. So the importance of packaging, why is packaging important to brands and the consumer? Packaging is the direct interface with the customer and should ensure support the, the following uh, product 
protection, product safety, product freshness, brand identity, so logo, colors, typography, etc., and technical knowledge about the product, so ingredients, origin of the product, etc. What's the current challenge? So in, in 2008, there, there was obviously a, a last global financial and economic crisis. The amount of packaging uh, waste decreased. But then in the following years since, the volume of packaging waste has actually increased substantially. And it's now at its uh, highest level since uh, pre-crisis pre levels. So just as an example, in 2016, 170 kilos of packaging waste was generated per inhabitant in the EU on average. And this varies from 55 kilos um, in Croatia to 220 kilos per inhabitant in Germany. So it's, it's a massive amount of packaging waste uh, generated. Um, what were some of the, the main types of packaging waste generated during this period? So paper and cardboard was the main one of the main um, packaging waste types generated in the EU. So 34 million tons of waste in 2016, followed by plastic and glass. So um, six, about 16 million tons of um, waste for each of these categories. What have big brands and producers been doing? So um, plastics, but also other packaging types have been an issue for big brands and big, big brands uh, and producers have been getting involved. So there's initiatives such as the new uh, plastics economy by Ellen MacArthur. I think Ellen MacArthur on, on the call today. There's the um, C circular initiative by the World Business Council. There have been many uh, various initiatives uh, by the EU. There's the EU uh, plastic strategy, uh, this, the EU circular economy strategy, and then there's the another global alliance to end plastic waste. So many the takeaway from here, many corporates have been involved in tackling uh, the plastics, but also packaging challenge in general. And also governments have been um, involved by passing legislation, single-use plastics directive, um, also forcing uh, or encouraging producers to, to tackle the problem for extended producer responsibility. Um, yeah, so just this, this slide here, just as I won't go into detail, but just a high level um, slide that summarizes the current plastic packaging situation. Everyone will have heard of the plastic soup. Uh, WWF is obviously very involved in in communicating about about this problem what and some of the key problems that we have because plastic is not well maintained in society it's not plastic uh, is a bad material per se it's how society manages plastic and because plastic is not well managed across society currently um, this has led to damage to marine life groundwater contamination air pollution commercial impact so people's businesses especially in the fishing sector might be impacted by plastic waste um, clogging of waterways etc so um, this, this slide here, so then I'm going to talk about the, the waste hierarchy. So in packaging, we want to go back up the waste hierarchy. So right now we might be, um, we might be low on the waste hierarchy in terms of how we use our, our packaging and, and plastics. We want to go up. So we want to go to recycling, ideally reuse and prevention. And when we go up the waste hierarchy, we can also see that it saves money. Not only is there environmental positive going up the waste hierarchy from say energy recovery to recycling, reuse, prevention, but it, it also saves money. But going up the, the waste hierarchy requires a, a change in consumer behavior and a change in waste management uh, processes as well. So this slide here really outlines how the circular economy could work for packaging um, and plastics in general. So everyone is important. Um, everyone is important in the circular economy here. So the consumer, the, the waste management company, local authority, recycling recovery, and then producing, um, so you need to recover the material to then be able to produce raw material uh, from, well, to produce new new plastic packaging from from recycled raw material. So there is this this circular chain. Everyone needs to be involved for it to work. Everyone needs to play their role. So the consumer needs to play their role. There needs to be waste collection, uh, sorting, recovery, and then the producer and the user. So it needs to use the um, recycled material in their new packaging uh, as well so I'll, I'll go on um yeah so what have been some of the some of the current barriers we've we've observed with some of our corporate clients and just to be transparent we're doing a lot of work with with various corporate clients on packaging innovation um some of the barriers that we've seen and the, the clients have also potentially noticed um uh, to, to using recycled plastics instead of virgin uh Plastics, poor quality of plastic waste um, separated. Um, yeah, there, there are different complicated approval processes for using the plastic recycled material in the new new in new plastic packaging. Um, yeah, and then problem problems with uh, quality quality and this is perhaps something for for regulators to look at the higher price of recycled products when compared to virgin plastic. 
and then there's often actually competition for for the waste plastics so sometimes the plastic actually goes to landfill or incinerator or production of uh, fuel from waste plastic I'll, I'll move on so just just a high level thing the eu single use plastic uh, directive so the eu has a uh, plastics strategy so to try and combat uh, plastic waste so to what the eu wants to help uh, plastic make re plastic recycle a profitable business curb plastic waste and stop littering, drive investment innovation, spur change around the world. Where we see the EU as a key driver is because of the EU single use plastics directive. This has had a ripple effect across the world and global corporates are also um, thinking about this because they want to access the European market, but also they're seeing other governments. So for instance, there's the Indian single use plastic directive, other governments and regulators around the world follow the EU. So that's the importance of the EU single use plastic directive. And these are the 10 different uh, products and scope bottles, but also cigarette butts, balloons, etc. So we see this regulation as sort of creating ripple effects and creating um, innovation in corporates because they, they want to keep selling their products on the European market and other markets. So they need to, to, to make changes. So then I'm going to do a high level overview here. So this is um, some advice and thinking we've been uh, giving to our corporate clients about some general trends uh, in packaging innovation. So um, innovation in terms of raw material and feedstocks used. So it might be bioplastics, um, advances in design and material substitution. So such things as light weighting, using secondary raw materials and new packaging, em embossing packaging design. So then also improving the end of life processing of packaging. So disruptive technologies such as near infrared can help with recycling. There's also very important uh, chemical recycling uh, of plastics. And we know that many oil and gas and chemical companies are very interested in this process because it can help us break down uh, plastics which are difficult to recycle currently through mechanical processes. And then importantly in, in the future of packaging, there's also consumer use phase of packaging. So how this impacts the consumer so, so we see innovations such as intelligent labels for packaging where consumers can scan the packaging with their phone get more information than they would normally be able to get out of the packaging so i'm just going to move through some of the innovations here so some of the future trends we're seeing so we're seeing sustainability as a key theme in driving um, changes in packaging so some, some issues like i mentioned such as light weighting um, and also why why this this change so this is in response to regulation etc such as the single use plastics directive and also can um corporates themselves um have uh, sustainability commitments so they want to change their packaging from a sustainability perspective some other big trends are digitization and packaging um product as a service so um in so this is interesting. So we've seen brewers in Japan um, selling a home tap. So rather than going out to the bar, and this is particularly relevant in COVID times, you have the, the beer actually delivered to your house. And what brewers like this because you can make more margin. So there's less waste because they're selling the keg, the refillable keg directly to you. It comes straight to your house. So it's convenient for the consumer. And there's also more margin for the producers. So that's interesting. If I just go back to digitization, so in digitization, so you can get information out of packaging, such as this black red ale here, where there's a digital app where you scan the, the beer bottle, and you get information, you get a more user experience. And then the final thing I want to talk about um, is just consumer experience. So in these times when consumers are looking for experience, packaging is the first, first thing they touch. So corporates are also using um, the packaging to differentiate themselves from competition. Um, so you can see here this this heineken club bottle which uh, is quite innovative as well okay that's everything thank you very much it was a, a pleasure to speak um and i look forward to questions as well okay thank you paula thank you very much edward that was a really great whistle stop tour of the innovations that you're seeing through your work um next we move to james um james all yours um Hi everybody and um, congratulations on pulling off a, a really great conference over yesterday and today and a huge amount of material and I see there's 106 people uh, still participating so uh, congratulations uh, on all of that and um, for us this is very useful learning as we are planning uh, Circular Economy Week London uh, for the first week of June and we're similarly going to do that in a virtual way so it's great to uh, get a sense of how to run these things and make them effective ways of having a conversation about an issue that is so phenomenally uh, important uh, to all of us. Um, so uh, what I thought I'd do is uh, a combination of 
big picture and specific things that are going on uh, in London. Um, and uh, just give you a sense really of uh, how we see this landscape with reference to plastics. Um, so, um, and I'm gonna start off with uh, what I think can be sort of used to frame all of this conference, which is uh, this trajectory of uh, CO2 related emissions that we've seen over the last 30 odd years. And clearly it's, it's gone up at an enormous rate and is still uh, much higher than we would want it to be. But if you look at uh, where we are, uh, we're starting to level off here. Um, and we know how to take this down quite rapidly uh, through the types of interventions around uh, carbon pricing, reducing fossil fuel subsidies, promoting uh, renewables and energy efficiency, um, making sure that we avoid deforestation, more effective food systems. So on the energy side of the things, we've got a, a lot of knowledge around what to do. But when we look at the global extraction of materials, we see this uh, extraordinary uh, trajectory. You know, back in the uh, beginning of the century and up until the Second World War, it was really very, very flat. Um, and then as it increases exponentially, we see it re re reaching the point that we are now, which is, according to Circle uh, Economics, uh, 100 uh, billion tonnes a year, of which about 8.4 billion tonnes is recycled. And we look at this projection forward and we see uh, this uh, continuing exponentially. Um, and this is really all going to contribute to consumption-based emissions and of course, plastics is an important part of that, uh, much of it made from fossil fuels. Uh, but I think as we've all agreed, it's rather too simplistic to say that of the you know, 9.2 billion tons of plastics that's been produced and the, the only 9% uh, uh, of which has been recycled, um, that the plastics has not been a very valuable contributor to um, society. I mean, it enables us to uh, keep uh, food um, fresh for much longer and that obviously has the benefits of reducing uh, food waste um, and it's also uh, lower weight and sometimes that means that it's a more effective um, uh, uh, vehicle for uh, uh, moving around transporting goods um, so so we don't want to completely vilify uh, plastics um, but we do need to think of it as a system and in particular as we think of it as a system we recognize the limitations of plastic as a single use material and we start to move to think about it as as a different type of material and of course all of us who are engaged in the circular economy are really thinking about those systems so you know how do we uh, start to get um, a collaboration that focuses on alternative materials improves labeling um, and also deals with some of the complexity of multi-material uh, packaging. So I'll, I'll touch a little bit on some of the regulation but also some of the innovations that we're seeing uh, here in London uh, and in the UK. So uh, as, we, as we talk on the left hand side uh, here there's uh, the four areas of, or three areas of, uh, of policy that sort of drive change uh, within uh, the plastic cycle and extended producer responsibility is one that we're uh, looking at here in the UK um, and it's uh, going to raise significant sums of money uh, to promote uh, recycling and um, uh, different materials and innovation in terms of the way in which uh, materials are used. Um, so this is a you know, well-established uh, approach. It's been uh, very um, familiar in electronics and electrical equipment as a result of the EU and exists already in other areas but you know, this uh, can really uh, transform uh, the uh, way in which we think about plastics and drive innovation and that I think uh, can potentially be uh, really very exciting and we see large companies like uh, Coca-Cola anticipating this regulation and thinking about what they're going to do uh, to deal with it and redesigning uh, the packaging and the way that that works. Um, you know, deposit returns. Halfway through, be, James. Yeah, thank you. That's perfect. We uh, we we rem remember well, of course, uh, taking our lemonade bottles or some of us who are older, like me, uh, and getting you know money back from them. So it's a very simple idea, uh, and I think uh, looking at the way in which they uh, might work uh, in the UK and, and differently for in the individual nations of the UK, 
uh, can be really quite interesting. And the third area, of course, is, is uh, packaging tax, pricing the externality. Um, and here the Treasury has proposed uh, some mechanisms uh, for that uh, and really uh, encouraging more uh, content, recycled plastic content in, into uh, products. And again, that will improve uh, the waste collection and the recycling because it will obviously need higher quality plastic to go into uh, the new plastics that are, that are produced. Um, and in London, we've got some great initiatives underway. Um, if you look at all of these, you'll see that uh, uh, they all have a great potential. I mean, what's interesting and what we're trying to do is bring these together in a more coherent citywide approach so that we can learn what's going on at a local level and think about how we apply that at a citywide uh, level. Um, so uh, some, some really exciting initiatives and innovation are going on there. Um, and, and again, I'll just refer briefly to some of these. Uh, biome is uh, uh, biomimicry, really. It's using uh, mushroom-based materials for construction, high tensile strength, and, uh, uh, and much more uh, sustainable. The second one here is, uh, uh, is Nopla, which is sachets uh, that can be used to um, uh, um, uh, transport uh, liquids and they use 35,000 of them at the London uh, Marathon uh, instead of water bottles, so a great innovation there. And those, and Cup Club as well, which encourages recycling of cups. Um, and uh, this one here is, is Unpackage, which is a business that helps uh, turn uh, shops into zero plastic waste shops and there's a, a great experiment going out with Waitrose in Oxford uh, that's having some very good uh, results at the front of house and back at the house and the supply chain a whole series of other changes that need to be made uh, to drive the changes that we're expecting there and these are all businesses that we've supported through our advanced London program and we're really hopeful that some of these will uh, make a a significant contribution and can scale up to being you know genuine circular economy business models of the future um, so uh, and I think you know what we've also looked at here is different types of materials and how they contribute uh, to um, uh, to the packaging uh, problem and, and what we can do uh, to re redesign them so we drive towards um, uh, less weight and uh, less overall plastic content in packaging. So to sum up, um, just a, a few takeaways really. Um, uh, you know, we, we define the circular economy as an economic system aimed at minimizing waste and making the most of resources. And I think, you know, it's really important to reflect on that as we think about innovation in plastics and how we want to transform the plastic supply chain. Um, now, as a climate guy, uh, I've been, uh, you know, really quite surprised at the engagement there's been about plastics. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we really welcome that uh, as, as part of the uh, discussion that we're having around climate. We, we need to harness the goodwill uh, to address the plastic problem uh, to ensure that it becomes part of the whole uh, climate uh, transformation that we need to make in order to get to, to net zero. So we need to think about those challenges in the carbon context. Um, and as I've, I've demonstrated, you know, policy is driving innovation, but innovation also needs to be joined up uh, with policy and particularly long-term infrastructure. We're seeing some uh, challenges around some of the biodegradable products and not really being able to insert into current waste systems, uh, which means that uh, the benefits that they have as a product don't really get realized because they get lost in the, in the waste system. Um, I think it's self-evident that the whole policy and, and fiscal incentives uh, have a role to play. And I think it'd be really interesting to think post COVID-19, how we use the inevitable economic stimulus uh, to accelerate some of this uh, transformation um, and encourage uh, businesses to be doing really exciting and sustainable things. Uh, so, you know, a lot of positive things, but I'll, I'll leave a final thought here, which is, uh, so an analysis done by ICIS, which was reported in the Financial Times, uh, showing the extraordinary uh, production capacity uh, increases uh, planned uh, for polyethylene output, which is obviously a key uh, part of the uh, plastic cycle. 
And, and you know, it looks when you look at this in terms of the amount of money that's going to be invested in these areas, this looks like a classic uh, non-systemic view of where we're heading um, and has the potential to increase uh, some uh, stranded assets uh, as we build the wrong type of capacity rather than the right type of cap capacity to bring to, to a lot of great work being done, but a lot of finance flowing in a way that is going to drive towards the right kind of infrastructure. So thank you very much, everybody, and uh, look forward to taking some questions. Thank you very much, James. And um, you bring up a few interesting points there from a waste minimization perspective. Um, and just be mindful that uh, the EU's direction of travel right now is looking at consumption reduction targets, which obviously leads to waste minimization. And the uh, UK's environment bill, which is paused at the moment, of course, there's a lot of focus on re resource productivity and resource efficiency as well. So thank you for making those points. Um, right, last but not least, we turn to Marcos. Um, Marcos, if you're ready to go. I'm going to talk about um, uh, the Peruvian experience uh, 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 being a developing country, and then I will share you some results on, on a research that we have done uh, recently. We are finishing that. Uh, so my, my presentation has three points, understanding plastic flows and informality in developing countries, the case of Peru, plastics regulations in Latin America and Caribe, and actions, Sustainable packaging and, and listen to nature is um, at the end. I'm, I'm having a, some sort of message in the context of the COVID-19. We have uh, made a balance, uh, material balance of plastic, plastics in Peru and specifically in Lima, capital city of Peru. And the model that we have used is, is this: we have, um, we have uh, this is this is the country. And we have imported plastic waste, recycled plastic, and imported plastic. We don't produce plastics. This is something that we have to take in, into consideration. And maybe the case of um, mostly the majority of uh, developing countries. Then we have the consumption and use of plastics. The consumption goes to three final uh, phases the environment which is this open air dumping uh, waste, landfill and recycle, and uh, a little amount of plastic that we use uh, The model is based on it in, in the simple equation of input process and output. This, these are the results of the natural, national flow of plastic materials in Peru. And then we have uh, 90, 90 90.5 percent of plastics as raw material we we are importing from different countries 0.5 percent we is imported waste plastic and we are recycling nine, nine percent of plastic at national level and our national production is uh, 1,386 uh, thousands uh, tons per year this is the balance for the, the year 2018 and then here we can see some disaggregated numbers. 9% uh, is recycled. 49% is disposed of in the environment, landfill plus open air dumping sites. 60% uh, is exported. And finally, only 26% of plastic remains in the system of plastic wood. We have produced that uh, based on two types of information. Uh, primary information, we have uh, made a, a survey in, in Lima City with formal and informal plastic recyclers. And then we have also uh, information from export from the National Authority of um, Customs in Peru. So we uh, organize the information so that we can uh, have this map. Uh, and then the, the, the conclusion, the, the one clear conclusion and obvious conclusion that we are, we are working on a, we are having a, a system to use, consume and dispose of plastics. So we are uh, far away from a circular economy plastic um, system. 
And all plastics, all the Peruvian plastics that is recycled or is collected in Peru comes to Lima City. Lima is the main um, a, a place where we are recycling the main plastic industry. This is uh, the, the result of how, what is the, the amount or what is the volume of uh, formal and informal recycling in Lima, capital city. Remember that Lima processes all the plastic of Peru. Uh, we are 30 million inhabitants and in Lima we have 10 million inhabitants. So it's one third of the country is uh, located in Lima, capital city. And this is interesting because 18% of recyclers are formal and 82% of recyclers are informal, but this 18% uh, formal recyclers commercialized 74% of the plastics. And 18, 82% of informal recyclers uh, commercialized 26% of plastics. So uh, the, um, um, the, we have a big amount of plastic, informal plastic recyclers or waste recyclers in general that only commercialize 26% uh, of the market. Um, one conclusion in this point that we have discussed with the Minister of Environment and other authorities is that the formalize, formalize, formalization of creating um, the informal to formal sector has a, more a social impact rather than an environmental impact. And therefore, is typically a, a, a policy, a public policy or a, a public issue rather than a private, in other words, for example, private companies uh, are not interested to, to, to promote formalization because the market share of the formal sector is, is uh, not big. In the case of pet waste commercialized, uh, the market share is, um, is lower. Plastic legislation in Latin America and Caribe. We have um, in South America six of 13 countries that have uh, plastic law, national law. Uh, to say that in, in the last years, it, it has um, been something like a fashion to have a plastic law in Latin America. So many countries are thinking to have a plastic law. Actually, we have a plastic law that was produced in 2019, and we have a national solid waste plastic law that was published in 2016, and we have a, a circular economy roadmap for the industry produced this year. Um, in our legislation, we have a producer extended responsibility strategies and, to, and tools, and we have also voluntary production agreements. And finally, in the circular economy roadmap, there is a chapter on promoting the plastic minimization and also the migration to alternative. Um, uh, in Peru. Marcos, just to say you're over halfway through. Okay. Uh, in Peru, um, I could say that, like in other countries, the, the regulation has made an interesting impulse to the market. However, we are producing different, the, the market is producing different types of packaging. In many cases, I could say in the majority of cases, we don't know really if they are a, a sustainable or they are appropriate. For example, this plastic bag says, I'm not plastic. And also innovation, there are some companies that are thinking to use the, the resources from the Peruvian rainforest to produce uh, packaging. However, the, the problem is the scale and quality. So we came up, to, came up to the point that how to move from this reuse economy to a real circular economy in plastic, how to promote a social and economic transition. And you see, I, I, I mentioned social and economic transition because 
I believe that uh, uh, the transition to a circular economy is more a social economic uh, uh, rather than a technological transition. Action for sustainable packaging. Uh, first of all, there is a confusion, confusion in the circular economy general application. Um, different sectors and different entities apply the, the term circular economy in different ways. So this is creating quite a confusion in the people and institutions. Uh, there is another question that we have to clear in, in countries. Uh, what is sustainable packaging? Uh, it has to do with material, with, with designs, and life cycle analysis. Um, it has to do also with sustainable chemistry and chemistry to find out new materials. What is biodegradable, recyclable, and single use? Uh, we don't have a clear standards to prove and to know that new packagings or better packagings or sustainable packaging are appropriate for the environment. Uh, so this is coming from the perspective of a developing country. We need international standards and national capacities for education and packaging. The formality uh, is an issue in many countries. So social inclusion and decent work programs should be implemented from coming from the public sector, especially. And sustainable packaging practice, practice and scale. Um, this is something which is very important is the consultation of uh, actors in the value chain for circularity. We have different actors in all the value chains and we need to uh, agree on basic uh, terms of operation and, um, and working and, and business uh, relationships that we move to a circular uh, and the capacity to manage the sustainable packages post consume. This is important because it's not only uh, uh, necessary to have a, a packaging that is uh, sustainable, but also we need to have the capacity to um, to manage after uh, post consume. And we need to have the infrastructure, the technology, and the enforcement capacity to deal with uh, sustainable packages. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can have a lot of sustainable packaging, but we cannot manage uh, both. Uh, listen to nature, COVID-19, climate crisis, and loss of marine resource due to plastic pollution. Um, and considering that marine resource are uh, the future of food for the planet, a dramatic message from nature to us. Roughly half of annual plastic production is destined for a single use product. Humans buy about 1 million plastic bottles per meal in total. So these are numbers that are not sustainable. Uh, I think I strongly believe that the, the consumers, the people, uh, has a lot to do to change this uh, linear model, in this case of plastic, to a circular model in society. So the future is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcos. I think it's really useful to get a view of the flow of plastics in a country like Peru, where they'll be facing different challenges, such as a huge informal waste recycling sector, and also raising um, what's a very relevant subject, the social impacts of plastic pollution. Um, so now we have about uh, 17 minutes or so for Q&A, we've run over slightly. Um, I can see the questions coming through. It's a very informed audience asking some very challenging questions. So um, let's start with a couple of questions to all the panelists. Um, I'll say them both together and if you could uh, reply to both uh, when you have your turn. So the first question, very relevant. Um, in the light of renewed public awareness of hygiene standards, do you expect more economies post COVID-19 to move towards much higher per capita consumption of single use plastic packaging um, akin to Japan's consumption levels? Um, if so, what might be the implications? And that question is from David, David Fitzsimmons. Fitzsimmons. Um, what I'd like to throw into that as well is get a view from the panelists on whether the COVID-19 crisis might impact um, consumers' attitudes towards reuse and refill and we've seen some businesses pull away from um, allowing reuse and refill. So in the UK, certainly 
Costa um, stopped accepting, uh, sorry, Starbucks stopped accepting reusable cups. And then the second question to all panelists is the role, the role of oil companies um, with climate change and net zero commitments forcing oil companies to diversify. Um, can we expect more of a move towards plastics from these businesses? And is that a good idea? So, um, Edward, if you want to go first. Yeah, the first question, the COVID one, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, from, from, from my perspective, discussing also with, uh, let's say, producers, I think producers have been making a move away from single use, at least some of the ones that we've been working with, single use plastics, because of the legislation. So a lot will depend upon the legislation in place. So EU single use plastics directive, um, other single use directives around the world. So we have seen this general trend to move away from uh, single use plastic packaging, but let's see what happened. I agree from the hygiene perspective that let's say in more food applications, drink applications, the reuse um, of packaging might be on hold. I've re Before the COVID crisis, I was on a field visit to, to Poland to uh, look at um, well, sustainable packaging uh, for a bank uh, in the Polish retail sector. And there, some of the more innovative companies had um, allowed you to bring your reusable packaging to the deli counter to, to fill up with for chicken, et cetera. But maybe that kind of thing will be on hold. So it can be a shame, but I can see uh, a reuse opportunity, let's say in soap containers and other hygiene with the huge volumes of soap, antiseptic, et cetera, um, shower gel, et cetera. I think I could still see, um, let's say, producers brands still going for the refillable containers in those. So I think for the food and critical hygiene things that there might be a short term reduction uh, for but for the let's say so non-critical um, for, for human health um, applications i think uh, can, the producers will still move away from from single use and also in line with the, the good work that regulators have been doing as well um, on the secondary issue about plastics so the wider plastics issue so we we at ey are material neutral and just to give a bit of context we've um, the slides i was presenting we've been doing an innovation project with a global brewer about the future of their packaging and we looked at plastics but we also looked at all material types so including even wood um, paper bottles etc so we're material neutral um, there are many aspects that, that producers looking at for, for their packaging so I, I mentioned digitization as well I, I mentioned consumer experience feel for the consumer etc so yeah I think it's important in this debate to be material neutral because often plastic gets uh, gets gets let's say unfairly attacked it's it's how plastic is used in society it's not the material itself the material is neutral and as James said, it's had a lot of benefits, um, you know, ac across society over the last 50 years uh, we've used it. I think just to summarize, because I know we need to pass on to, to James and Marcus, I think oil and gas companies um, and chemical companies, they have a, a role to play as well. We've been advising a big oil and gas company on chemical recycling. So where uh, mechanical recycling of plastics can't be done, chemical recycling could be a viable option. And that's definitely something to look at. And I know it's something that the EU Circular Plastics Alliance is also looking at standards for chemical recycling. So we were actually advising our client about the standards because say you put uh, 50,000 tons in, how do you certify when you sell it onto Walmart or to Tesco that you've got 50,000 of um, recycled plastic coming out of the process at the end, you've obviously blended it with your virgin um, virgin polymers, but you need, you need to be able to certify that. Otherwise you just got something in and you can't say what you've got coming out. And I think uh, in terms of coming back to James's carbon, um, carbon discussion about plastics, there are plastics with a long-term use. So say in car parts, in buildings that are embedded for 20 to 50 years. So that's embedded carbon. So it's not necessarily bad. It's just the single use plastics where, where the, let's say the carbon cost is in doubt um yeah so i'll pass on to james and marcus but, uh, thanks very much for the two questions they were very good questions thanks, edward james yeah thank you i mean i'm not sure that the answers to our those are very self-evident so i mean I, I think the the covid one i think is 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 interesting i mean i i would sort of wrap it up with the whole um, concept of behavior change and and I think the way I think about this is that um, you know we're making the case for net zero uh, by 2050 at the latest if not uh, before and that's going to require massive uh, shifts in uh, finance uh, policy and behavior and those things have to come together um, so uh, and also you know crisis breeds opportunity as well so 
um, maybe we have to rethink some of these in the context of uh, food hygiene and uh, that pathway to net zero in a way that is optimized. And that's, I think if you present the problem like that, then it has the potential to drive real innovation and um, some exciting new developments. I think, I mean, on the oil point, uh, I mean, it's a very broad uh, point. And I think if I was sitting in an oil company now, I would be starting to fret about what my business model would look like in the future. Um, uh, but, um, but, but oil is a, you know, it, it is a complex uh, product and the refining process gives rise to a whole series of different uh, chemicals, which you know, at the moment are all sort of taken together. So I think we'll find uh, some big shifts in terms of the way in which uh, those uh, materials are all used. Um, and, uh, you know, it may, we, we talk a lot about gas being a, a, a bridge, a transition fuel. But I don't think increased uh, plastics capacity in the uh, supply chain uh, can be a bridge uh, forever. So again, I would go back to where do we need to be in 2050 and what kind of rational decisions are policymakers and financiers going to uh, make around that and what implications does that have then on oil fir firms and where they invest their you know, marginal dollar of capital to get the greatest return. Um, and I would hope that that would be in you know, non-carbon innovation around electric vehicles and things like that, rather than high carbon uh, and, and, you know, more extraction and production. Thank you very much, James. Marcos, would you like to take those two questions on? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, here in, in, in Latin America, the COVID-19 has um, put in, in the agenda, in the public agenda, the environmental issue. Uh, because uh, you know our cities are um, are cleaner air pollution is uh, much uh, air, air is much cleaner and in some cities we are producing less waste so people is taking into consideration the environmental dimension in their lives and we, we are forced to be more resilient to use uh, home um, uh, products uh, in a more um, resource-efficient way. So I think after COVID-19, our society will be more um, aware of uh, the environmental dimension. So programs to minimize plastics and to move for a proper packaging or sustainable packaging, I think that will we have um, more. Uh, will be more. Uh, we, we have more echo. Of course, not, not immediately after the COVID-19, but I think that the society is very more aware of the need to have a more sustainable planet. And also, uh, climate change, it has been mentioned in different uh, uh, events. Climate change uh, crisis is, is keeping, uh, is keeping importance in, in, the, in the world. So I think that, uh, Plastic minimization and innovation on plastic will have, um, um, I, could, I could say, more opportunities for, for implemented in, in our societies. Of course, there, there will, for, for the moment, we have stopped uh, all recycling programs. Uh, people is not recycling anymore uh, because of uh, health risks, but. Um, I think this is um, a moment. moment uh, this is a situation for the moment, but uh, I, I, I can imagine that in the future we are going to have uh, more opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. A question to Edward, and this is one uh, which is one you touched on in your presentation, which uh, none of the others did, but. Um, could you talk a bit more about the digital digitalization of packaging through NFC and AR? And that's from Alessandra Scottesi, if I pronounce that correctly. Yeah, that's uh, thank you very much, uh, Paula, for the question. So this is just 
Um, so, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, I went through briefly, we've been looking at the future of packaging with a, a global brewery client. And one of the aspects where they uh, see to differentiate themselves from competitors, but also create brand loyalty is to, let's say, embed um, codes in their packaging. And then you would scan, you would scan the code and you get uh, more experience. So as I showed in my slide, um, alternate reality. So you, you'd scan a packaging, so a, a beer bottle, and you'd see some graphics that would appear just on your phone. So it's again about using packaging, not just to package the good, but also as a, a, man, a brand retention for brand retention, and also as a means of engaging with the customer. So using, um, let's say, code on, on the packaging to, to engage better with the customer. It can also be used you know, for, for basic health and hygiene things, like to, so rather than touching the packaging, you could get, so relating back to the COVID question as well, you could scan it potentially from a distance with your phone, and then you could see all the ingredients, allergens, et cetera. You could see where it's been and it also relates back i think in the previous uh, session you had something about blockchain so um ey has also been doing something on packaging uh, using blockchain to, to prevent fraud in the in the food actually in the in the wine industry so we've been working in italy with a wine producer using blockchain from let's say from grape to, to bottle and then the end consumer can be assured of the let's say the quality of the wine, that it's not counterfeit because wine, the wine industry has a big counterfeiting problem. So that there's a lot we can do with technology. Um, I hope that, that answers the question. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. And I think it, it makes us realize that sustainable packaging isn't just about alternative materials, it's also back to technology innovation that helps the whole circular framework. Um, question to James, um, let's have a look. There's been a question about, um, Elaborating on the idea of stranded assets, what type of capacity do you class as the right type, the right type of capacity? And that question's come from Jaimin Jethwa. Um, James? Well, it, I mean, it's a great question. And I think uh, the uh, challenge here is to be really uh, joined up about the way in which we're projecting uh, waste growth and building the infrastructure around it. So, you know, I think there's a lot of incineration capacity uh, being added. Um, and you know, this isn't uh, consistent with uh, circular economy principles. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a way of getting rid of waste, but it isn't really keeping the product in use for as long as possible with the highest value that it can have even if you're turning it into from waste to heat. Um, and some of that's driven, the increased incinerator capacity is driven by the expectation that waste is going to continue uh, to grow quite significantly. And if we are really going to get beyond the um, uh, waste, uh, the, the sort of recycling argument and into the waste minimization and uh, the whole reuse point of materials, uh, then we're going to have to think differently about the um, the infrastructure that's required to support that. Um, similarly, you know, we need uh, uh, multi-resource uh, facilities that can actually uh, produce consistent and reliable, high-quality plastics for recycling, uh, particularly as we start to put uh, those into uh, new materials. Um, and I think all of that. And this is all long term infrastructure, so it needs to be thought through very carefully uh, so we don't make bad decisions today that we're going to regret in the future. And James, just to add on to that, do you think that direction as to what we should be investing in should come from businesses who obviously have vested interests in growing in certain areas or should it be coming from a higher policy level? Well, um, I think business responds to policy um, and I think um, but in this dynamic sometimes business is leading policy and I think again it depends from country to country um, around how that dynamic works uh, but uh, and, and you know I think what we're seeing with some of the more enlightened businesses that they are pushing this through uh, which will you know drive policy to follow but I, I don't think as a business, I would want to be a laggard here. I'd want to make sure that I was at least keeping up with policy um, and, uh, and wasn't finding myself on the wrong side of, uh, of this debate. Because I think what we're seeing in terms of the mobilization of ESG investing and the uh, shift away from uh, the energy or carbon intensive 
uh, businesses is uh, is going to you know keep going. I don't I think that's you know we've now broken down the so-called tragedy of the horizons, and we're now thinking about uh, what uh, is realistic in terms of the long-term viability of, of future businesses. Brilliant, thank you, James. And if I can take the liberty, because I know we've uh, pretty much run out of time, but to ask Marcos a question that's come through, which I think is really relevant. Um, what kind of international standards do you think might be required for um, guiding what is sustainable packaging? And I think this is particularly relevant in the context of how waste infrastructure, um, recovery and recycling might differ from region to region and country to country. Uh, we, we need uh, to have um, clear standards on what is biodegradable, um, of course, because we, and, and also to, to have, uh, as mentioned before, a proper infrastructure to deal with um, biodegradable plastic. And also, uh, for example, what is single use and what is not single use plastics, uh, this is also important. We don't have clear standards, so we, we, we don't have uh, how to enforce uh, the companies and different actors in the value chain need this, this standard because we are in, in the moment to, we are in the moment to produce these standards. And I think that it's not a issue of a country. It should be a, a, a global issue. We, we should have global standards on biodegradable, sustainable packaging so that all the countries use the same standards. This is the ideal situation because we are also having a waste plastic change and we are not producing many uh, products in Peru and in developing countries we, we import a lot so it, it's very reasonable to have a global standards and global eco labels for all. thank you very much Marcos um, I think our time is up, which is a shame because there have been some really interesting questions coming through. I'm not sure if these questions um, are going to be available for the panellists to answer separately um, outside of this conference. But um, thank you very much to Edward, James and Marcus for joining on this discussion. I think we've uh, moved it away from um, the ever uh, the 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 continuing debate about bioplastics and bio-based and touched on things like technologies, um, you know, definitely in the context of climate change and also having the different perspectives from different parts of the world. So thank you very much. And um, I think it's a lunch break now, but over to you, Patrick or Melissa. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Paula, for moderating. Very nicely done. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you, Paula, for the moderation. Thank you to Marcos, James, and, and Edward for, for the presentations. That was a very fascinating session.